Hi everybody, welcome back to Critter Pulse. So excited you could join us. I'm Dr. Brian Moran and I'll be your host. Thank you so much for all the feedback that we've gotten so far. We're really excited about where things are going and wanting to see what we can do to help you and your family stay together and make sure your pets receive the best care. To that vein, I thought today would be a wonderful day to talk about feline cardiomyopathy or heart disease of cats, specifically the adult cats. Before we jump into this, please don't forget, please like, comment, subscribe. Let us know what kind of topics you're interested in. Let us know how we can help you and what we can do to educate you more about heart disease and animals, making sure that, that all of the pets get the best care that we can provide. One of the first things that any veterinarian learns in vet school about cats is they have no rules. Cats are tough. We love them. They're sweet. They're wonderful family members. They're wonderful pets, but they are challenging to work with not just because they can sometimes be temperamental, but specifically because they hide their disease so incredibly well. Um, one of the things about them is, is their behavior kind of from the wild animal that's become domesticated. They'll really hide and kind of tuck away. They'll kind of sulk away if they have disease, realizing that they're sick, which makes it very difficult for, for owners for families to realize, hey, there's something wrong. Cats get very challenging from a cardiac standpoint because they have multiple different diseases that are unfortunately common for them to develop, but none of them are, are pathognomonic from radiographs or none of them are classic for an exam finding. We're gonna hear in a cat, much like we do in dogs or other species, either a murmur sound, which is a turbulent blood flow, kind of a, a swoosh, swoosh, swoosh sound, or we're gonna hear a gallop sound. Literally sounds like, like horses' hooves on, on the field. Da -da -da, da 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 This kind of triple cadence beat. A normal heart sound should just be a lub dub. So one, two, kind of lub dub, lub dub. And this gallop sound that we'll hear is da 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 We do get a question fairly often that says, oh, well, why do I need to do an echo? Why is that important for, for my cat? Well, the reality is it's essential in our cats. In dogs, if I had to guess at a disease based on their patient signalment, based on their age, chances are good I'm gonna be pretty, pretty close to that. In a cat, though, they have one disease that's the most common, called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. That represents about 70% of heart disease in adult cats. They unfortunately have a fairly high percentage of both dilated and restrictive cardiomyopathy, both of those being published as above 10% each. Now that's challenging because that says 20% of cats, so that's one out of five. 20% of cats are going to have one of those two types of heart diseases, the restrictive or the dilated cardiomyopathy. Those get managed very differently and they're a very different underlying disease process than our hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, okay? I will go over each of these individually on kind of an uh, overview level in just a moment. We'll talk later in later videos about these diseases more in depth and more specifically so you understand what they are. We'll start with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or HCM. What this disease is, is an abnormal heart muscle thickening, and literally the heart muscle grows in an abnormal way. The best way that I can explain this is that the heart muscle should really be a nice organized series of muscle fibers, kind of like a game of tug of war. When it's time to work, they're lined up, ready to pull and squeeze and get a really good, really good work and get a really good squeeze of blood going out into the body. In hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, what happens is this thing called myocyte disarray. In simple terms, instead of these nice organized muscle fibers, we end up with this meshwork or spider web of cells. Obviously this is not going to be able to generate the force that a nice organized uh, string of tug of war would do for us. This heart muscle is far too thick, it's abnormal. A lot of damage can happen on a cellular level with uh, poor oxygen supply, some scar tissue forming. As the heart muscle gets too thick, it's not relaxing correctly. That means pressure start to build up. Eventually the left atrium or the upper chamber of the heart can start to become dilated. That puts cats at risk for both heart failure as well as blood clots. And I'm gonna talk about blood clots here at the end. Another disease that's quite common is called dilated cardiomyopathy or DCM. This disease is exactly what it sounds like the chambers themselves start to dilate and get very, very big. This is because the heart muscle itself fails. The muscle fibers are not able to generate the force that they need to, meaning blood sits in the ventricle. That's kind of a stimulus to, to have the heart start to dilate and get bigger and bigger as the, the poor muscle just cannot generate the force that's necessary. 
these cats need a very special type of therapy where we're focusing on making the heart squeeze more effectively. Where in the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the heart muscle itself is far too thick to begin with. Another disease that's very common is restrictive cardiomyopathy or RCM. This is a very frustrating disease because there is no cure. And, and my experience says that the restrictive cardiomyopathies do the worst out of all of these patients, uh, meaning their survival time is the shortest, as well as their response to therapy being the poorest. But what this disease is, is a very interesting one where effectively scar tissue kind of invades the muscle itself. And if you have a scar anywhere on your body, you know it's not a particularly resilient tissue. Um, it's, it doesn't stretch very well. Obviously, scar tissue doesn't squeeze. It doesn't generate force to send the blood forward like we want it to do. So restrictive cardiomyopathy really needs therapy focused on how can we help the heart relax as well as how can we help it squeeze more effectively. But we realize as we go into this, we're fighting scar tissue. We're fighting this fibrous tissue that isn't gonna respond and, and isn't resilient, which really can make it challenging. So hopefully those three diseases make sense in the big picture of one is too thick, one, the chamber's way too big and not squeezing. And the third, the heart muscle is infiltrated with scar tissue, unable to relax and unable to squeeze. As, as it makes sense, those are three very different avenues of what we would need to do to treat patients and help them live better and longer with high quality of life. This is why the echocardiogram is so essential for a kitty cat. All of their examinations between any of those diseases would essentially be the same. We might hear a gallop, we might hear a murmur, we also might not, which is a really scary situation for, for cats because many cats with even advanced heart disease don't have auscultatory problems, making it very difficult for your trusted veterinarian to actually identify this particular disease. Something that's very important to talk about whenever we talk about feline cardiomyopathy is something called an aortic thromboembolism or ATE. What this is, is a blood clot and it's a very scary condition for, for cats. What happens is a blood clot will form inside the left atrium. It will eventually dislodge, travel down the aorta, and it can actually block the blood supply to the back legs, both the right and the left, potentially just one of those. Um, that's the majority of the cases. Uh, in about probably eight to 10% of cats, they actually will have their right front leg be impacted. And then a very small percentage will have their left front leg be impacted. This condition, this ATE, can happen as a result of any cardiac disease in cats. That makes it very scary because any disease can cause it and it is a life-threatening situation. It is very, very painful. The way that it's been likened is if you've ever had your foot fall asleep to that point it's really painful, you try to step and you get that tingling, burning sensation, imagine that from your waist down. It's a very serious condition, very serious complication for cats and again, any heart disease could lead to that in a cat. So it's important for us to understand what the stage is for these kitties, understand what the disease is so that we can treat them correctly. We can start medications to minimize the chances of a blood clot forming. Now, the good news is our medications are generally very effective at that particular role, but nothing is 100%. So we always have to be on guard for that. In addition, any heart disease could lead to congestive heart failure, which is that fluid buildup inside the lungs, inside the belly, or around the lungs that we talked about previously. For cats that even have suspected cardiac disease, and maybe it's really mild, maybe we're not worried about any major problems, a big worry we have is what about those patients undergoing anesthesia? Certain anesthetic drugs can really put an extra workload on the heart and can really be very dangerous depending on what the disease process is. Depending on that, it can either make the heart really squeeze too vigorously and really work, overtaxing it, or potentially it could really alter the blood pressure, uh, potentially decreasing it very seriously when you already have a failing heart that's struggling to get the blood out and in, into the body the way that it needs to. So that can make anesthesia very dangerous and very difficult. For that reason, any cat that has a murmur, an abnormal heart sound, or the gallop sound that we've discussed, should absolutely have an echocardiogram before they go to anesthesia. We want to know what the disease is. Hopefully it's very mild. Hopefully it's not significant. But if it is, we've got to make the right protocol and make the right recommendations to make sure the cats make it through surgery, get home with their families and get to be with their, their loved ones the way they should. 
So like I said, that's an overview of cardiomyopathy in cats. It's very complicated. There's a lot of different options there. So I am gonna hold some more in-depth conversation about each of these for later videos. But I wanted to kind of give you the overview of this is what's going on, this is why we're worried about it, and this is what we do to figure out what is our disease, and then we can optimize our treatment for that individual animal. I'm really looking forward to reading your comments. I can't wait to hear what more you want to hear, what you want to learn about cats or any other species with heart disease. Certainly we'll be looking forward to bringing you the next video. Again, please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. Let us know what we can do to help you. And if you're in the Seattle or Tacoma regions and you're worried your cat has heart disease, my team would be thrilled to take care of your cat and help you figure out solutions for this. Again, I'm Dr. Brian Moran and it's absolutely my pleasure. I hope you have a wonderful day. We'll see you soon.